Hello, friends, and welcome back to Malicious Compliance Stories. Let's start our video with a story in which our OP encounters a boss from corporate nightmare land. Should have pre-approved my remote day due sickness. Okay. In my old job, we had a great boss and hybrid work. If we had any reason not to come to the office, just a message to him and extra remote day would be approved. Then he was let go and we got a new boss who was exact opposite of her predecessor. This happened a few weeks after our old boss was let go and his boss became our new boss. One morning I wasn't feeling well, too sick to travel to the office, but not too sick to work from home. I had a couple of remote meetings with customers, so it was just easier for me to work while being a little sick than trying to reschedule. I spoke with my boss in Slack, and our conversation was like this. Me. Good morning. I have a sore throat and a slight fever. I'll be working from home today, so no need to reschedule anything. Boss. Our employer handbook clearly states that remote days are Tuesday and Thursday, and exceptions need a pre-approved by the manager. I was pissed. Is she really trying to force me to the office even when I'm sick? Or what was her motive? But then it hit me. It doesn't matter. And our discussion continued. Me. Oh, sorry. That's true. Me. I have a sore throat and a slight fever. I am unable to come to the office, so I'm taking a sick day. Could you ask someone to reschedule the meetings with customer A and customer B since I'm recovering at home at least for today? Me. The employer handbook states that I can take three sick days in a row without a doctor's note. But I'm willing to make an exception if you want to and get you one. Do you want it? I was left on red for 10 minutes. She started typing, deleted the text, started again, and deleted it again. She was active in our chat for entire 10 minutes until I finally got a response. Boss, no, that won't be necessary. I'll ask someone to reschedule those meetings. Get well soon. My colleagues almost died of laughter when I told them why having a sick day and not just work from home... Our boss didn't like me after that, but the feeling was mutual. I left the company later for a new job, but not before she was fired. Edit. Several people are asking for why she was fired. She was commercial director last year before she joined the company. It made 606 k profit. In her first year, 413 k Second year, 1K. She was fired at the end of the third. Numbers aren't public yet, but they're similar to the last year. If they somehow managed to stay profitable at all. She had previous experience from companies over 20 times bigger than that, and she was hired to help the company grow to the next level. Unfortunately, her skills were just to implement heavy processes and stiff organizational model. Her commercial department had seven people working under her, and there was four sub-departments, sales, productization, account management, and marketing. Four in sales, two in productization, one in account management and marketing was handled by an outside contractor. We had 26 employees in total. We in sales were completely in new business, and after we had a signed agreement, account management took the contract role. Our former boss was head of sales, and he suggested that salesperson could be the contact for the first year or even handle possible upselling, selling more to the current customer. But the commercial director didn't even let him finish before said no. So the company lost a lot of money when not doing the upsell. It's pretty common that companies start with a small deal with a new software and expand the use step by step. For some reason, this wasn't an option if the customer didn't specifically ask us to provide more licenses. She was there before I was, but during my time, she focused on standardizing the sales process which led to us losing the sales and bringing in less money. For example, we couldn't modify text and proposals for the customers without asking a permission from productization, and even after that, only marketing would be allowed to make changes. And this was even in situations where the customer didn't want some feature or product had. We couldn't even remove the text about it. I once counted that my proposal introduced 11 features, and nine of them were completely irrelevant to the customer. Two of them were something that the customer had explicitly stated that they didn't want those. This was a software, so it had some features customers didn't use, but that didn't affect the pricing, so it didn't matter. It led to situations where we heard from the customers that we focused in completely unrelated things, not those which were relevant to the customer and their board chose another vendor, even if the internal champion believed we were much better, which we said would happen before this new model was implemented. 
Some other standardizations led to the situations where owners asked something for us to do something and we had to decline since we weren't allowed to do that. They respected her role even when they didn't agree with her decisions, but it's hard to believe that it didn't affect her termination. She costed her about 2 million euros to the company, and that doesn't even include her salary. And for the top of that, she turned the company culture to something the owners didn't like, so she was expensive, difficult person, and hard to work with. Hybrid work. Use when a company knows that having people in the office is not actually necessary, but they'd rather increase air pollution than admit they lease too much office space. And our second story. It's not even the wedding yet, and my wife is kicking people in the face. Alright, so my best friend's finally getting married. As the best man, I'm way far behind on things such as getting my own formal wear tailored, as I've lost a ton of weight over the past year. Also being Valentine's Day, the wife and I decided to go to the appointment at the local shop together before grabbing some wings and beers for happy hour. As I'm standing in the mini funhouse of mirrors with what appears to be a 207-year-old Asian lady controlling my every move, only saying, no, 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 anytime I even shift my weight, I hear a man, roughly 6 feet, 200 pounds, saying, excuse me, over and over again, assuming he's looking for another member of staff, the three of us ignore him entirely. Finally, after the third or fourth excuse me, the guy screams, are you effing deaf? as he grabs my wife's arm and spins her around violently. Now, my wife is 5 feet and about 105 pounds. However, being the daughter of a retired U.S. Air Force colonel and current agent of the Alphabet Gang and retired Navy lieutenant herself, my wife has years of training in a few schools of martial arts such as Krav Maga and Taekwondo. As this man spun her around and towered over her, she elbowed him in the diaphragm and firm, but gently pushed him back away from her while stating, I don't work here and keep your hands off of me. Having God knows how many needles and such all throughout my inner thigh and nether regions, I wasn't really able to move, so I did the next best thing and attempted to tell the guy to F off and leave my wife alone. Before I could get the words out, however, old boy had decided to charge my wife in a full fighting stance with nothing else really to do, wife took a half step back into a stance I'm used to seeing on Saturday mornings as I meander into the basement with a cup of coffee. As dude draws back a punch, leaning all of his weight into it, wife spins, and as she comes back around, the Doc Martin she's wearing connects with the side of the guy's face. Full tread pattern. Unlike in the movies, he didn't go flying through the air spinning, his trajectory immediately changed to that of a crashing airplane. Fully unconscious, dude turned into one of those circular racks of clothing, almost completely disappearing inside. Finally, another member of staff comes running, saying the police are on their way. It took about three minutes for the police to arrive, and as they walked in, dude was just finding his way out of the tangle of expensive dress clothes I thought would be his tomb. With statements from myself, the two staff, and finally cameras, dude not only found himself with a shattered orbital and a few broken teeth, but he was handcuffed to the gurney as they loaded him into an ambulance. I swear, I can't take her anywhere. Heck, even if she did work there, there's no excuse for a customer to touch a store clerk, ever. Good job, wife. HOA I've lived in the same house for over 10 years now with my wife, three daughters, and our loyal German Shepherd Rex. We bought the house right after we got married. Big yard, pool, the perfect place for the kids and the dog. Life was good. Our neighborhood was always peaceful and friendly, no issues at all. But then, it came. The HOA. When I first heard some of the neighbors were talking about starting an HOA, I immediately got a bad feeling. We were all living just fine without any extra rules, so why the need for more? But of course, the majority voted for it, and a year later, the HOA was officially formed. When one of the board members, an older guy named Frank, came by with the paperwork, I just smiled and said, no thanks, we're doing fine without it. I remember Frank smirking at me. You'll change your mind, buddy, he said with this weird smug grin. I shrugged it off, but a few days later I got the first friendly letter in my mailbox. It had a list of all the new rules we were supposed to follow. First on the list, no dogs over the size of a corgi. Seriously? I'm supposed to get rid of Rex? My dog is part of the family. My kids adore him. I didn't give a damn about their stupid rules. The next rule, no pools. 
a pool. Half the houses in the neighborhood already had pools. It was one of the main reasons we bought the house. I read through these ridiculous rules and couldn't stop laughing. There's no way anyone's going to take this seriously, I thought. But within a couple of weeks, things started to shift. The first anonymous letter I got seemed harmless enough, just a friendly reminder that I wasn't following the rules. Whatever. But then the tone of the letters changed. They got more aggressive. One letter outright said, if you don't start following the rules, there will be consequences. We need to maintain order in the neighborhood. A week later, I walked out to my car one morning and saw scratches down the side of the door, and on the hood, someone had spray-painted comply. What the hell is going on? My wife asked, staring at the damage. Looks like our oh-so-respectable neighbors think they're gods now, I said, trying to hide how much it was really bothering me. That's when I decided to install security cameras around the house. A few nights later, the cameras caught several shadowy figures creeping around our yard. These weren't some prankster kids, they were adults moving with purpose. I called the cops, but as expected, they didn't do much. Not enough evidence, they said. And then it got even weirder. One evening, I found another letter in the mailbox. This one wasn't anonymous, though. It said, if you want the truth, meet me at the old oak tree by the park tomorrow at 6 p.m. Are you really going, my wife asked when I showed her the letter. Of course. I want to know what the hell's going on, I said though I wasn't entirely sure myself, who sends cryptic messages like this? Some kind of prank? The next evening, I went to the oak tree. It was raining lightly, starting to get dark. I was just about ready to leave when I saw a figure standing in the shadows. It was Mark, a neighbor I hadn't talked to in a long time since he moved away a few months ago. Mark, is that you? I asked, stepping closer. Shh, keep your voice down. I can't stay long. They might be watching me, Mark whispered, looking genuinely terrified. Who's they? The HOA. They're not who they say they are. It's a cover for a group of local businessmen. They're buying up houses at rock-bottom prices. If you don't agree to their rules, they start pressuring you. Letters, threats, vandalism. It's all them. Wait, what? Are you serious? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mark nodded, his eyes darting around nervously. They've already forced several families to sell their homes. They forced me out, too. After they threatened my wife, I had no choice but to move. Why are you telling me this now? Because you're next. You're one of the few who's still resisting. They're planning to make you sell. You need to leave before it's too late. Mark handed me a stack of photos and copies of letters. The photos showed scores of vandalism, the faces of some HOA board members, and even screenshots of shady real estate deals. That's when I realized this wasn't just about annoying rules. I'm not going anywhere, I said firmly. And be careful. They won't stop. I went home and told my wife everything. Do you believe him? She asked. I'm not sure. But we have to do something, I said, feeling a surge of anger. Who do these people think they are trying to bully us in our own neighborhood? The next day, I gathered all the letters, photos, and footage from the security cameras and took them to a lawyer. He advised me to go public, so I did. I contacted the local news, and they jumped on the story immediately. Within a week, reporters were all over the neighborhood. The news spread like wildfire, and other neighbors who'd been pressured started speaking up. Within a month, there was a full-blown investigation. Turns out the head of the HOA and several members were involved in a real estate scam. They were forcing people to sell their homes at dirt-cheap prices and then flipping the properties for a huge profit. All the key players got arrested. Now our neighborhood is quiet again. Sometimes I think my dog's smarter than some of those HOA members ever were. I hope the fact that English isn't my first language didn't interfere too much. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.